can one of America's greatest wildlife success stories continue with Chris Servine and Todd Wilkinson. This is one of a whole series of events taking place from January through April, culminating in a very exciting Earth Day Festival on Earth Day itself, April 22nd, right here at the Emerson. I'm thrilled to see all of you here in the Crawford Theater, and I also want to give a big shout out to the over 500 people that are joining us online tonight. My name is Ann Reddy, and I am the chair of the Gallatin Valley Earth Day Committee, and we are very lucky to have Chris Servine and Todd Wilkinson with us tonight. Um, I first read Todd's book, Last Stand, Ted Turner's Quest to Save a Troubled Planet, uh, maybe eight years ago, and I was just so impressed with that book that I have to say that almost everyone I talked to, I was... Um, <clears throat> recommending that they read that book because <laughs> I thought it was so great. Um, and now Todd's latest book called Ripple Effects, um, by the way, it's for sale in the lobby out there, um, How to Save Yellowstone and America's Most Iconic Wildlife Ecosystem. Um, this book was the inspiration for all of our events this year for Gallatin Valley Earth Day. Now, before I introduce our first speaker of the evening, I would like to thank our partners for this evening, which are Mountain Journal and Gallatin Wildlife Association. Mountain Journal, which was founded by Todd Wilkinson, does a fantastic job of covering wildlife issues. And so I encourage you, if you haven't already, to go to mountainjournal.org and check out um, the great articles on that website. <clears throat> Gallatin Wildlife Association is involved in numerous interesting projects to save wildlife, such as wildlife crossings. So please visit their website at gallatinwildlife.org to find out more about what they're doing and how you can help. <clears throat> Lastly, um, tonight's event is free only because we have the support of many businesses and organizations in our community. So I would like to give a big shout out, thank you, to our fiscal sponsor, Greater Gallatin United Way, to our premier sponsors, which is the City of Bozeman, uh, Audi Bozeman, and Gallatin Subaru. In addition, our benefactor sponsor, which is Sacagawea Audubon Society, and our stewards, this includes Bridger Bowl Ski Resort, uh, Valley of the Flowers Landscaping, Happy Trash Can, and last but not least, Gallatin Wildlife Association. It's only with their generous support that we are able to bring you tonight's program. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give a big thanks to the Emerson Center for the arts and culture, and to our fantastic tech team back there, which includes Lorene Reed and Emma Narotsky from um, Sacagawea Ottoman Society, Dak Dakota Stordahl from the Emerson, and Jonathan Crouch and Cody Lindblom from Poindexter's. <clears throat> and now, on to our program. Uh, before I bring Todd and Chris to the stage, I would like to welcome Clint Nagel, who is the president of the Gallatin Wildlife Association, to say a few words. Uh, Clint had a long career working for the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, he retired in 2009, and then, lucky for us, he uh, made his way to Bozeman in 2011. Uh, he now keeps himself very busy with important volunteer work where he sits on the board and he is president of the Gallatin Wildlife Association and stays active with several other nonprofits in the Gallatin Valley. So if you'd please join me in a round of applause and welcome Clint Nagel to the stage. Clint. <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Uh, I'm going to keep this very short tonight. Um, I'm up here only for one reason, and that is to plug a petition that we have out in the back or in the lobby out front. Uh, 
As you may or may not know, the uh, state of Montana has come out with a draft statewide grizzly bear management plan. And as you may guess, a lot of us in the environmental community are not too happy with that plan. And the comment deadline for that is February 4th, three days from now. Uh, if you have not submitted comments yet and would like to have your voices heard, we would advise you or suggest, urge you to uh, sign our petition in the foyer out front uh, before you leave tonight. Um, it, unless you're going to submit comments on behalf of yourself anyway, I uh, think the petition is at least one way that your voice can be heard. And that is important and critical, as we will learn tonight, that uh, grizzly bears are not necessarily uh, in the best place on this earth if we want them to exist in our lives. So with that, I will walk away and give it back to Anne. Thank you. Thanks so much, Clint. And, and for all you people online, I would encourage you, if you want to um, help with this effort and make some comments, you can go to gallatinwildlife.org, and there you will be able to put some comments in. So, Okay, now, before I introduce Todd to the stage, I just wanted to let you know that we will have a question and answer period after Chris and Todd are done speaking. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, if you look at your screen, there'll be a column on the right, and if you go partway down, you'll see um, a place where it says questions. So you can type your questions in there, and then Emma, who's sitting at the back of the theater here, will read those questions to Todd and Chris for us. Um, if you're sitting here live in our audience in the Crawford Theater, um, we have volunteers that will go around and pass out index cards with pens if you have a question. So just raise your hand after it's done, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of our volunteers will come and hand you the card so that you can fill out your question, and then they'll collect the cards and take them back to Emma for her to um, read them to Chris and Todd. So, okay. We are now ready to introduce Todd Wilkinson. Sorry, Todd Wilkinson, stay by the mic here. <laughs> Todd has been a professional journalist since 1985. Uh, as I mentioned, he is the founder and writer-in-chief of Mountain Journal. Now, Mountain Journal is a Bozeman-based conservation journalism nonprofit, uh, and you can go to mountainjournal.org um, to see that, and they have readers from all around the globe. Um, Todd's work has appeared in a wide variety of national publications, including National Geographic, the Christian Science Monitor, uh, the Washington Post, and lots of other prominent national publications in between. Um, he, Todd is also the author of several critically acclaimed books on topics that range from Ted Turner to scientific whistleblowers to the harrowing life of the famous Jackson Hole grizzly bear mother, 399, and this book features photographs by Thomas Mangelson. As I mentioned before, his latest book is Ripple Effects, How to Save Yellowstone and America's Most Iconic Wildlife Ecosystem. And as I said before, this was the inspiration for this talk and our whole series of talks this year. So please join me in a warm welcome to the stage, Todd Wilkinson. Well, welcome. Can you, thank you. <laughs> well, welcome tonight. It's, it's um, great to have all of you here live and uh, for those of you who are tuned in from across the country. It really speaks uh, to the public interest. Some of you are probably at Night of the Wolves um, a while back, and uh, this is just yet another iconic species that we're so fortunate to have here. First of all, I, I just want to do a shout out for Gallatin Valley Earth Day and uh, Anne Reddy, 
who is really a rock star with bringing this program uh, to the fore. Thank you, Anne. And also to the Gallatin Wildlife Association. Um, you can find them at, at that address, and they're doing uh, great conservation work, making public events like this possible. So let's hear it uh, for both Gallatin Valley Earth Day and the Gallatin Wildlife Association. And also to Poindexter's just an amazing crew um, of folk with Billy Costigan and, and all of his teammates. Um, just can't say enough great things about them. So think about bear spray. It was a radical technology disruptor of bullets. It was a great non-lethal tool that really changed the way we interact with grizzly bears. And tonight, Chris will be speaking about what's most important is that we reduce our lethality. And so Mountain Journal was formed uh, six years ago because we really needed an intense focus, uh, media focus on the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Three states, two national parks, five uh, national forests, 18 million acres of public land, 6 million acres of private land, and what happens on private land affects public land. Anyway, I hope that you'll check us out and read us. So this is, you know, journalism is a great non-lethal antidote to those who spout alternative facts. And we're here tonight to get away from alternative facts and get at the truth. And uh, again, there's nobody better here than Chris. Tonight is both a celebration and it's part of a cautionary tale about how we can never take things for granted and how each generation needs to step up and make a difference. That is, if living in a place with an animals like this matter. Before we begin, let's see a show of hands. There's a lot of people here tonight and watching at home who have spent untold thousands of days covering hundreds of thousands of miles in grizzly country. And so my question is, let's see a show of hands out there. And if you're watching from home, how many of you have been fatally mauled by a wild grizzly bear? <laughs> So the question is, why is that? Think about it for five seconds. Really think about that. How does the fearsome reputation align with facts? You know, there's a great statistic that since Yellowstone was founded in 1872, there have been 200 million human visits paid to the park. Center of the ecosystem, largest concentration of grizzlies in greater Yellowstone, and over 150 years, eight fatalities. And Chris will speak tonight to some of the causes of that, but most of them were related to humans doing dumb things or having done dumb things to bears. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christopher Servine. He says you can call him Chris. If we had assembled here 20 years ago, you would hear Chris being a vocal proponent of delisting or removing grizzlies in greater Yellowstone and northern Montana from the protection of the Federal Endangered Species Act where they're classified as a threatened species. But trends playing out in recent years have caused him to be an opponent to delisting. Tonight, you'll find out why and what he has to say is important. Chris, for 35 years, was the national head of grizzly bear recovery for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Some people called him the grizzly bear czar. He oversaw recovery. He helped bring bears back from the brink. He's been involved with crafting tactical management decisions, assembling the science, investigating lethal human bear encounters, and sometimes testifying before Congress. 
He's an adjunct professor at the University of Montana and has been an advisor on bear conservation in the world, around the world. And he's investigated poaching and illegal trade of bear parts uh, that are used in medicinal, for medicinal purposes in Asia. Tonight, meet citizen and citizen conservationist Chris Servine, who is also president and board chair of the Montana Wildlife Federation. In addition, he's head of the um, Bear Smart program in Missoula that's bear proofing containers and teaching people how to better coexist with grizzlies. He's going to take us tonight on a journey, how we almost lost the great bear, how it was recovered, and how we, t how we need to be paying attention. Now, let's give a warm Bozeman welcome to Chris Servine. Thanks, Bob. Oops. Should we turn this one off, or maybe our mic guys can tell us what to do here? Well, thanks, Todd. Um, we appreciate everybody coming tonight. We hope we can tell you a good story about what's happening with bears and, um, and that you'll leave here with a better idea of what needs to be done, what the problems are, and, and what the, the issues are that the bear faces. Um, we'll kind of go through a history here. You know, when the, the Native Americans lived with bears for probably 10 to 14,000 years here, um, before the Europeans arrived, us Europeans arrived. And, uh, and they had encounters with bears. They respected the bear. The bear was a, a strong medical, uh, medicinal totem to them. You know, they were respectful of bears. They feared bears. They knew the power of the bear, um, but they lived with the bear. So, in terms of Europeans, uh, the first Europeans that described grizzly bears that I'm aware of were in 1602, when the Spanish were on the coast of California and saw these big whitish colored bears eating dead whales on the coast. And they didn't know what those things were. Um, Lewis and Clark, of course, had lots of encounters with bears. They fully described the bears. Most of the grizzly bears that they encountered, they tried to kill. Um, with the result that many times they had to, what say, they called, betake themselves into the river. Um, um, and excessive persecution throughout most of the grizzly bear range occurred until 1975 when it was listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, direct persecution was the major cause of, of grizzly bear deaths. Um, and the tolerance for grizzly bears was really low. You know, people thought the grizzly bears were a threat to people, a threat to livestock, a threat to civilization, and everything that could be done to kill grizzly bears pretty much happened. Um, that was the time of manifest destiny, when it was thought that the job of everybody was to settle the West, to civilize the West, and to use all the resources out there to the greatest extent possible. And here's this mountain of bison skulls, which is really pretty hard to understand how they could kill that many bison so fast. But there were probably 40 to 60 million bison out there by the time that Lewis and Clark arrived. So by 1885, uh, the grizzly bear had been completely exterminated from the prairie. Remember Lewis and Clark were out there about 1804, 1805. And uh, by the late 1800s, grizzly bears were gone from most areas, and most wildlife was gone from many areas. And I want you to read this quote here. This is out of a paper by um, Ehlers Cook in 1941 in the Journal of Wildlife Management. He lived in the Gallatin, lived in Bozeman, and um, he was brought up in the Gallatin Valley. He usually spent most of the summer in the hills in the 90s. He's talking about the 1890s. And at that time, game was so scarce that the sight of a single deer, elk, or sheep was most unusual. Bears he doesn't even talk about. I often traveled for weeks with a pack outfit through the high mountain country without seeing any big game. That's the area around Bozeman today. 
That's the 1890s to the early 1900s. And this was the, um, the general way that, that bears were treated and thought of. Um, this is a painting by C.M. Russell. Um, Ropes and swift horses are surer than lead. The end result being to kill the bear, any bear that was seen. It's important to realize that strychnine, a really terrible poison, was the main killer of bears. And most wildlife, this quote here, a supply of strychnine was part of the outfit of every shepherd. And by means of this, the numbers of bears each year diminished until many sections were formerly they were very abundant, they have entirely disappeared. Strychnine use peaked between 1860 and 1885. Remember the grizzly was gone from the prairie by that 1885 time period. So any carcass that was found out there, they'd put strychnine in it and everything that ate from that carcass died. Every bear, every wolf, every coyote, every raven, every eagle, all of them died. There was literally thousands of tons of this poison that was distributed throughout the West, and we pretty effectively eliminated most of the animals. The range of the grizzly bear shrunk. Used to be, they used to be found down into um, central Mexico. Oops. And um, um, by the time eight, 1975 came, those little island populations were the only places where grizzly bears were left. This is the, um, the expected range or the thought of range of grizzly bears in 1922. And by 1922, you can see the grizzly bears were just found in small remnant island populations in the wildest places left in the American West. And... Um, before the coming of Lewis and Clark and all the, um, all of the European settlers, there were perhaps 50,000 grizzly bears on this map. By 1922, they were small isolates. And then in 1975, they were listed under the Endangered Species Act. Of course, 1922 is a, a, an important date because that's the last year there was a wild grizzly bear in the state of California. Which state has the grizzly bear on its state flag? So they thought enough of the grizzly bear to put it on the state flag, and then they went and killed every last one of them. So, summary, once abundant throughout the prairie, um, present throughout the mountains as well. Um, very abundant in California, which probably had the most grizzly bears of any state in the western United States. Um, Tense persecution eliminated them from the prairies by the 1880s. The mountain populations were small isolates by the 1920s. And this is, um, what, would, what would you say? It's uh, primitive bear watching in Yellowstone National yeah. Park, maybe in the 20s or the 30s. Um, pretty up close and personal. The recovery story of grizzly bears and how the idea of maybe we were not doing the right things with bears, it started in the national parks. And of course, most of you probably know that there was a long history of feeding garbage to bears inside the national parks, both in Yellowstone and Glacier. And um, there were literally hundreds of tons of garbage that were fed to grizzly bears every year inside those national parks. And with all those bears eating all that garbage, there were an average of 48 human injuries per year inside Yellowstone Park. 48. If we had 48 human injuries this coming year at Yellowstone National Park, it would be a disaster, a crisis. There'd be congressional panels. There'd be all this arm waving. But that was regular. Every year that was happening back then. I just lost my microphone here. Um, and then there was an average of 138 property damage incidents per year inside the park. So the bears were, you know, they were into tearing people's tents up and looking for garbage, looking for food. And then something happened. 
to change public attitudes about this garbage issue. On one night in 1967, two different women were killed by grizzlies in separate places on the same night in Glacier National Park. Both bears had fed on garbage inside the park. This prompted reconsideration of how grizzly bears were being managed in the national park. That's 1967, that's not that long ago. Finally, the availability of tons of garbage to bears inside the national parks was recognized as probably a bad idea. And the dumps were to be eliminated. So just ponder that for a minute. Up until 1967, we took all the garbage out of the Lake Hotel and Mammoth and places like that and dumped it. And in all the surrounding communities like Cook City and Gardner and West Yellowstone, they all had their own dumps that grizzly bears were in all the time as well. This night in 1967 was made famous by this book and uh, probably a movie as well. And um, it was a tragedy, certainly. So what happened when the dumps were closed? Well, as expected, there were a lot of bears that got into further trouble because they, used, they were used to spending time in the dumps all summer, and there weren't any dumps anymore, and so they spent a lot more time in the campgrounds and in the towns, Cook City and Gardner and West Yellowstone. And all these bears were dying, so there were 60 to 70 or more bears dying each year in the early 1970s. And this prompted a study team effort to kind of understand what was going on. You know, is this going to be bad? The Craigheads were working in here at this time. Craigheads had been working in, in monitoring the bears that had fed in the dumps and what they were doing. And the Craigheads were very concerned that if the dumps were closed abruptly by the Park Service, that the bears would die. They would be gone because they couldn't survive without the dumps. So the whole recovery effort of grizzly bears started by putting the grizzly bear on the Endangered Species Act, or under the Endangered Species List. The grizzly bear was petitioned for listing in 1974, remember the early 70s is when the dumps were closed, by the Fund for Animals, and, um, and they were listed in 1975 as a threatened species. And amazingly enough, they put this out for public comment, and there were 500 public comments received about listing the grizzly bear. 500. That's a big number to me, because when we proposed to delist the bear, we got over 180,000 comments. So the people are more involved in grizzly bears now than they were back then. So here's the reason that the grizzly bear, this is the actual wording in the original listing. There was a reduction in range. It was livestock grazing, timbering, and road and trail construction. It was indiscriminate illegal killing, excessive control actions related to livestock and sport hunting, possible impacts of the isolation of populations, and finally, the rapid closing of the garbage dumps. Those were the five reasons that the grizzly bear was listed in 1975 as a threatened species. And this is what we thought was grizzly bear range in 1975 when they were listed. All these areas were identified and listed. Of course, we're in Bozeman right now. And uh, since that listing, we know that the bitterroot bears were actually gone. They were probably gone by the early 50s. And the North Cascades bears were functionally gone. There might have been three or four bears in the North Cascades right along the Canadian border, but both of those populations were really gone already by 1975. So let's back up for one second here. I'm gonna do this here. In the Yellowstone ecosystem, there were perhaps 150 to 200 bears. Nobody knows for sure because there wasn't a good count, but there weren't very many, and you can see they were isolated. They were separated from everything else. 
And in those populations to the north, we really didn't know how many bears were up there either. Um, uh, nobody had done any good science on bears at all. So the four things happened to began, that began under the, the recovery effort. And the four major things that happened were mortality control, habitat security was enhanced with motorized road access closures. One of the most contentious issues in grizzly bear management is closing existing roads on the forest. Sanitation was enhanced both on public and private lands. So remember all that garbage out there, all that garbage had to be cleaned up. And even into the, the 80s, there were open dumps around the parks and lots of open dumps outside the parks. And finally, public support was built and increased to support the recovery of grizzly bears. So essentially the recovery process involved implementing all those things across a vast landscape of um, ecosystems and all the ecosystems of the agencies, you know, you had state agencies, you had tribal agencies, federal agencies, nobody wanted to cooperate. Nobody really wanted to do this. You know, when I would go in and, and I was, my job started in 1981 as the recovery coordinator to implement the recovery plan and I would go and talk to the park service. The park service was very supportive, but they didn't want to know, do anything outside the park. They didn't want to talk about stuff outside the park. That wasn't their, their business. Forest service told me, well, we do timber harvest. We don't do wildlife. You want to talk about wildlife, you've got to go talk to the, the state fish and game agencies. And the states were mad. They were really mad that the grizzly bear was listed under the Endangered Species Act. And they were furious, and they didn't want to participate at all and they would say bad words to me when I would go and try to talk to them, or they would never respond to, to you know, requests for meetings, and, and uh, things went pretty slowly there. And what I thought is that I was gonna preside over the demise of the grizzly bear. We'd never get all these agencies to work together. We could never do all the things that were necessary, and the bears were gonna die. At this time, in 1981, there were perhaps 30 adult females in the Yellowstone ecosystem, total. And they were on the verge of extinction. So has grizzly bear recovery been successful? Hey Chris, before we, before we go on, you, we, you mentioned another anecdote that we've talked about over the years, which was, you thought that it was possible that bears were gonna wink out in Yellowstone. Could you share a bit more of your thoughts on that? Well, because there were so few adult females present, um, you know, the likelihood of keeping those bears alive, given what was going on at the time, the difficulty of agency cooperation, the fact that we had sheep right up along the park boundary, the entire Targhee boundary on the west side of Yellowstone Park was full of domestic sheep. There were no grizzly bears over there because every one that went over there disappeared and died. Um, you know, trying to get everybody to work together was almost impossible. And uh, they were isolated. This was an island population. The nearest bears were hundreds of miles away up in the northern Montana. And so, it was pretty likely that we were going to lose the grizzly bears in Yellowstone. And interestingly enough, when I went back to Washington, one of the times I went back there, you know, I told this story about, well, you know, we're going to lose the grizzly bear in Yellowstone. I know they're listed, but there's nothing we can really do to pull everybody together to get this job done. And there was a lot of concern because the politicians both at the federal level and the state level, didn't want the grizzly bear to go extinct on their watch. Particularly the Yellowstone grizzly bear because it was very well known what was going on in Yellowstone. The Craigheads had done a lot of geographic specials and geographic magazine articles about grizzly bears in Yellowstone. Everybody knew they were there. And so um, that idea that they were gonna be lost on their watch prompted these politicians to start working together. They created what's called the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee and the governors of the four states of Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and Washington signed this document along with the Assist Assistant Secretaries of Interior and Agriculture at the Washington level. And this document basically said, you guys will all work together to implement the Grizzly Bear Recovery Plan. 
And that's what got us over the hump and we began to start making some progress. But it was only because people were worried that it was going to happen when they were in office that they, they signed on to this. And that thing, that document, this MOU, signed by the governors and, and these high officials, got everybody to start to work together. Great. Thank you. So just, you, you just heard him say that he thought grizzly bears could disappear from Yellowstone. And, and for the young people who are out there who have grown up at a time when there's never been a, a, a non-healthy grizzly bear population out there, they've never grown up when there hasn't been wolves out there. And you, you heard Chris talk about the Wild West and how it became dewilded. What I want to mention is just this miracle. I mean, just think for a moment. You're all here or you're watching at home. Think about this miracle of bringing back one of the most difficult to recover mammals on Earth. And we did it. You all did it. Everybody had a part of this. And here we are in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. The first radical idea was Yellowstone in 1872. And the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, much of which was advanced because of grizzly bear conservation and concerns about the bear and a, a special report in Congress, the Congressional Research Service, that really became an impetus for the founding of the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, uh, you know, bioregional conservation group here. But just as Yellowstone is an island and just as Greater Yellowstone is an island, we know from reading uh, David Quammen, Bozeman writer David Quammen's writings that species wink out faster when they're on islands. And we also know that people recognize from Yellowstone's earliest days that it wasn't big enough to sustain wildlife populations. And so this is part of the miracle. The greater Yellowstone ecosystem is the only ecosystem in the lower 48 with all of its major mammals and all of the major species that were here in 1491, the year before colonization. It's the only place. We have wolves and grizzly bears, a lot of imperiled species, but the miracle is, is that after the West was dewilded, conservation rewilded Greater Yellowstone and brought it back. These, these were all decimated populations which is why Greater Yellowstone is known as the cradle of American conservation. And so we have this, we have an example of this elk that spiral into Yellowstone National Park, sort of like a bike wheel. 12 different herds, they come in in the summer following the green wave up into the mountains and then they go back out again to lower elevation across, oftentimes across private lands to get to winter range that they need. And they do this, they go back and forth. We have the longest wildlife migrations of elk, pronghorn, and mule deer known to exist. A couple people, there's a great group called the Wyoming Migration Initiative that you should check out. They're leading the country and leading the world and thinking about this stuff. But Chris will talk about the importance of this in a bit, but it, this is just another part of the miracle. And then wolves were brought back in the mid-90s to complete the suite of, of predators that we have here. And today, because of grizzly bear recovery, this is a great Tom Mengelson photograph. And that's grizzly bear 399, and that's her cubs. This is Jackson Lake Lodge up here. You can sit out on the veranda and you can watch predator and prey interaction as, as fine as anything you'd see in Africa. And 399 is teaching her cubs how to stalk elk. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the, um, the current status of grizzly bears after all that recovery effort went on. Started in 1981 to today, and I'd like to recognize the interagency grizzly bear study team that produced all these data. The study team is the science foundation of the grizzly recovery effort in Yellowstone, and um, 
you know, it's really important to have good science and to make decisions based on facts and science. And that's what has happened in Yellowstone because of the efforts of the study team. And these are some of the study team members. I believe some of them are here tonight. I can't see you because of the lights, but um, you know who you are. You know, Frank Von Manen, Mark Haraldson, Carrie Gunther. By the way, Carrie was responsible for those videos you saw at the beginning. Um, all these people at the state and federal level have worked together really closely for decades to bring the grizzly bear to where we are today, and we owe them a debt of gratitude. So, way back when, this, um, what's the, where's the spotlight? There it is. Okay, okay. This time period is, um, the early 80s or so, um, and back when the grizzly was first listed in 1975, there were probably like 200 or so bears. But um, you can see how the population has increased. And so today, um, there's about 1,050, 1,100 bears or so in the Yellowstone ecosystem. In this DMA area that I want to highlight that. This map shows the Yellowstone area, and here's Yellowstone Park boundaries, and the dark area is the original grizzly bear recovery zone, place that we thought grizzly bears would be in order to occupy. When we started the whole process, we drew these big lines thinking we could maybe have grizzly bears as far out as where you see those, that recovery zone line. When we started, there were hardly any bears outside the recovery zone. And um, the DMA is what's called the demographic monitoring area, and that's this crosshatched area. And this population estimate is in that crosshatched area there. And this is the numbers of females with cubs each year in the system. And right now, um, there's over 80 females with cubs in the Yellowstone ecosystem each year. Remember when I... I told you that when we were starting out, there were probably 30 females in total in the system, not just females with cubs, but total adult females. And right now, each year, there's over 80 females that are out there with cubs. We've had a conversation over the years. We go back and forth about how you manage for populations, not for individual bears. But the other thing that we talk about is the importance sometimes of individual bears, because all female bears aren't created equal. This, of course, is Grizzly 399. If she comes out of her den this year, she'll be 27 years old. She's alive today for a number of reasons, but a big one is, is that in 2007, she mauled a school teacher at Jackson Lake Lodge, not far from where that Tom Mengelson photograph was taken. She had been feeding with her first three cubs on an elk carcass. School teacher didn't know she was there, gets mauled, survives. And a call was made. She easily could have been killed that day because when the rangers arrived, they thought that instead of feeding on the carcass, she went back to it after the, the mauling victim was taken away. She easily could have been killed that day, but two calls were made. The first call was to Mary Gibson Scott in Grand Teton National Park, and she called Chris Servine, and the decision was made to keep 399 alive. Easily, things could have gone the other way, but she was kept alive, and we'll get to the fact of what her legacy is. And remember, think about those 30 females, 30 bears uh, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And as you know, she is the, the most widely recognized wild bear on earth, and we'll talk about her in a bit. So this, this graphic shows the expansion of the population over time, and we're gonna let this run for a little bit. This is the study team's work. So the dark areas are the range of the grizzly bear as it expanded. So remember the, the, the um, 
Here's the park boundary, the original recovery zone. Um, there were no bears outside the recovery zone when we started. In fact, there were very few bears outside the park. And the purple line is that DMA, or demographic monitoring area. There's Cody. Here's Lander. The year's at the top. So this happened because more bears lived longer and had more cubs. People became supportive. They started to do things differently. Here, we'll let it run again, starting in the early 90s. People started to do things differently in the backcountry. They stored food properly. Bears didn't get shot. We got all the, the sheep out of the targhee on the west side over here, and the population expanded down into the Wind Rivers, bears in places where they hadn't been in over 100 years. So the ecosystem is pretty well full at this point. And there are now grizzly bears between, here's the north end of the ecosystem, here's Bozeman right about here, here's the northern continental divide ecosystem, Missoula is right about there, and you can see every one of these dots is grizzly bears outside those ecosystems. Remember, here's the recovery zones, the Yellowstone and the NCDE. There were hardly any bears outside those places when we started. And now these populations are getting really close to connecting. They're probably only about 50 or 60 miles apart. And it, we'd like to see these populations connected because connected populations makes for genetic resiliency. And um, that's a good thing. So remember we started with this, these, these six ecosystems where we thought grizzly bears were in 1975. And we know that there weren't any in those two big places. And um, there were almost no bears outside those blue lines in the Yellowstone, the Northern Continental Divide, the Cabinet Yak, and the Selkirks. In fact, the Selkirks probably had two or three bears. That was it in 1981. They just came down from the, the Canadian side here. And there was actually a graduate student that we got into the Selkirks to do his master's on the Selkirk bears. He caught one bear. His sample size was one. And that bear lived right on the border and went back and forth. And when he flew that bear occasionally, he could see it with another bear on the Canadian side. Right now, there's about 80 bears in the Selkirks up here on the, the US side. So this blue, the blue areas today are the places where grizzly bears um, may be found. And you can see that they are well beyond the recovery zone boundaries, and they are very close to connecting here, north and north e northwest of where we are in Bozeman. And eventually we'd like to see these, these populations connected. We're also seeing some bears that are moving down into the north end of the Bitterroot and these populations are starting to connect as well. We have bears moving out on the prairie, and we've actually had at least three different bears that have, these are female bears that have gone out on the prairie and denned on the prairie and had cubs. That's what they were doing when Lewis and Clark were here. So that's the first time we've seen prairie occupancy by females having cubs on, in their dens on the prairie in over 100 years. Remember, there's our map of the, the, the little dots that you see there, all uh, verified sightings of grizzly bears out here in the distance. So um, can recovery continue? That's probably the focus of our, our discussion tonight. Increasing numbers of people with increasing numbers of bears make things complicated. Um, there's 334,000 more people who live in Montana today than in 1975 when the bear was listed. And the grizzly bears, there's probably at least five times or more grizzly bears today in Montana as there were when the bear was listed. So this overlap of the two species becomes really challenging.
So based on this trajectory, we would think that bears could expand ad nauseum across the landscape and um, that they could go forever. And remember I said that Chris had been a major proponent of delisting and he changed his mind. These are a few of the reasons. Remember the trajectory of the bear population. Well, this is being met by something in greater Yellowstone. This is the projected population, 800,000 residents. It doesn't include the part-time residents. This is number of homes out on the landscape. Within 20 years, we're gonna add 100,000 homes to greater Yellowstone. At Bozeman's current growth rate, we're gonna add 60,000 people to the Gallatin Valley in the next 10 to 12 years. This is what we think of when we think of development, overtaking habitat. This becomes basically unusable for all species except weedy species like white-tailed deer and coyotes and raccoons and skunks. This is a, a slide that Chris put up. Could you, you spoke about one of these things. This is, um, you know, what you can find if you go to the website and, and the web and look for Travel Montana. So I just pulled these off the, uh, the, the site there. Look at what some of those things say here. Look at this one here, the third one down. It says, warning, visitors who travel to Glacier National Park may never want to leave. All these people are coming to Montana, and a lot of them are staying in Montana. That's having an effect on grizzly bears. This is the uh, numbers of out non-resident visitors in Montana each year. So in 2021, there were 12.5 million non-resident visitors to Montana. There's about a million people that are residents in Montana. So that for every one of us residents, there were 12 tourists who came to Montana. And a lot of these people like it here and they stay. But as you all know, and for people watching, when you move to Montana or the Northern Rockies, it comes with responsibility because this place isn't like anywhere else. This is a John Potter cartoon. He's a cartoonist for Mountain Journal. Self-explanatory on the prevailing attitude. We all want our piece of paradise, but at what cost? So remember the earlier slide that showed dense development. The problem in Gallatin Valley right now is that even when Bozeman pr promotes dense development, if there's not cooperation, collaboration with the county, you get sprawl like this. And you get sprawl on elk winter range. There was a study done by uh, one of Chris's colleagues, uh, Chuck Schwartz, in conjunction with some other researchers in Bozeman, and they found that a grizzly bear will exhibit avoidance behavior on, if there's a home on one section of land. So a home on 360 acres will cause a grizzly bear to avoid that. And what's bad for grizzly bears is bad for 230 other species in the ecosystem, and what's good in terms of protecting habitat. This is a great slide by Holly Pipple. This is what this looks like today outside of Bozeman. Prior to COVID, over 15 years prior, the Gallatin Valley, which is along with Bozeman, sort of the capital of greater Yellowstone, the crown, 100,000 acres had been lost, but that doesn't count the level of displacement that happens because it's not just the physical structure of the home, but it's barking dogs and roads and lights and smells and, and all kinds of things that come with it. So these, these movement patterns of elk, you know, that were, have been in place for thousands of years in response to seasonal needs to move across the landscape and be in, in 
um, places that are that are melted out and lower elevation in the winter time and then move into higher elevation areas in the summer. These are important to the survival of these animals. And as you just saw in those slides, as we keep filling up the winter range for wildlife, what do we expect to happen to these animals on the landscape? And I'll make an editorial comment here is there's a lot of talk about affordable housing right now. You know, and we need more affordable housing and we've got a, an affordable housing problem. I think we've got a population problem. So this is instructive again. This, is, um, this shows the growth of the grizzly bear population, the expansion out of Yellowstone National Park. But guess what it's overlaid with? This is the population projections. So in 2017, I met with a couple demographers, and at the current growth rate in 20 years, Bozeman and the Gallatin Valley were going to double in size from about 120,000 to 240, uh, roughly Salt Lake City sized. Proper, not the whole Wasatch, but uh, if you extrapolate that out and it doubles again, will be Minneapolis sized by roughly 2065. Remember, these were projections that were done before this inundation of COVID. When this map appeared, people were in denial. They said, no, it never happened. But everybody in this room and many people watching realizes the inundation that happened with COVID. The interesting thing in the southern part of the ecosystem is that currently there is a population, a Salt Lake sized population that if you play tic-tac-toe between Idaho Falls and Star Valley, the question is what's going to happen in the next 20 to 30 years? Will a Salt Lake sized population double there? So you saw this, Bozeman up here, Jackson here, we've got Big Sky here. And then you see Cody growing, Billings uh, ballooning in population. What are we gonna do about that? And most of the development actually is occurring outside of towns. So this, this growth of human populations in bear habitat is now threatening the future of grizzly bears and many other species. So we made great progress to where we are today, but now we're putting more and more people on these bears, both in living places and in recreation places. And these things have an effect. Hundreds of bears have been killed through management removals. While we gained the population that we had, we have to manage bears. There are conflicts, there are issues, and there are illegal kills, bears hit by cars, and various other reasons. But, you know, we lost a lot of bears over time. But as more and more people start moving into bear habitat, these numbers of bears that die are probably going to increase. This is the leading, bleeding edge of grizzly bear management and the future of grizzly bears. As more grizzly bears move into habitats where people are moving into bear habitat. So we've got expanding bear numbers, we've got expanding human numbers. This is the, the big challenge we have today as bear managers. These things never work out very well at all for the bear. This is 399 and her four cubs. Look where she is. She's living in and among people in the Jackson area right now. This is good. She's very tolerant of people, but this is really risky. It's risky for her. It's risky for all the people that she interacts with. She's super tolerant. She's done really well in raising all the cubs that she has. But as she gets older, her teeth are wearing down. If she comes out with cubs this year, she's probably gonna be nutritionally stressed feeding those cubs. She's really old now for a grizzly bear female. 
and look where she is, where she lives, where she's used to hanging out. And, and mention that one of the cubs. Yeah, one of her cubs, one of these four that you see here, got into conflicts that became habituated, which is a loss of fear response and avoidance response, and had to be removed close to a town, a settlement. Will you talk about the lack of tolerance in exurbia and suburbia, too, and that loss of habitat? Yeah, the, you know, as people move into places like this, they, they tend to think that, you know, they're more important than what's living there. Or, you know, we don't want bears around, you know. They, they call fish and game and they say, you know, there's, it's the spring and things are melting out and now there's a bear in my yard. What do I do? And bear managers want to tell them to move. <laughs> but... No one is tearing houses down. They're only building new houses. It's just continuing everywhere that the grizzly bears are today. So here's an opportunity for, for some conservation. So one thing you all could do is support your local land trust. They're doing great work um, buying land, are buying easements from willing sellers. Uh, lo lots of ranchers and farmers out there are doing it. The challenge is though, Brent Brock, a local uh, independent scientist, noted that in many of the valleys around Greater Yellowstone, for every acre, every acre of open space that's still open, remember the development footprint out there in the Galton Valley isn't going away, but for the open space that remains, so for every acre that's protected, we're losing two acres at the same time. Which raises the question, what do we do? At Mountain Journal, there's a story about uh, options. And one of the things that we need to talk about at the county level, we need to stop uh, having it as a taboo topic, is zoning. Zoning is one tool. Conservation easements are another tool. But in the 20 counties of Greater Yellowstone, most counties have been reluctant to embrace zoning. It's only planning, voluntary advisory planning without tough enforcement. And we know what happens when the free market doesn't have guidelines in protecting wildlife habitat. What we get is we get a strip like the one from Belgrade uh, to the mouth of the Gallatin Canyon. So this is an important point. Recreation is a consumptive activity. It consumes wildlife habitat security. It causes animals to avoid people and where that, those recreation activities occur. And there's more and more recreation. All these people moving in here want to go someplace. They want to go mountain bike. They want to go hike. They want to go hunting and fishing. They go on the public land to do that. And so the public land managers are pressured because they're getting more recreators. And so they want to put in more opportunities for recreation. And this cartoon kind of portrays the, the, the issue. There, there's a great phrase in this um, John Potter cartoon, underutilized parts of the backcountry. Often we pursue things only from a homocentric human perspective, but if you interviewed wildlife, there's no animal that would say that its habitat is underutilized. Look, we're all recreationists here. We all love to get out. In fact, it makes us feel better. It's good for our mental and physical health. One of the questions I think we should all ask, and when I ask you this question, you'll never be able to unforget it, is how good is it for the mental health and physical well-being of wildlife when we enter their space? Everything is pretty much, you know, we talk about reciprocal arrangements and relationships with nature, but when we think about it, and it's something we really need to change our mindset on, is what can we not take? You want to take that one? <laughs> So imagine if, if imagine if this were a chessboard or a checkerboard. Imagine, uh, you know, animal, nature. The, imagine this being coexistence. 
The problem is, is that this kind of fragmentation doesn't end up very, very well ever for wildlife, and that wildlife eventually gets erased at the edge of the margins. But we've operated with this concept of public lands called multiple use, and it's an assumption that we can do lots of things at the same time. But in truth, if we want to maintain a world-class wildlife population that exists here and nowhere else, we have to change the way we think about how we manage both public and private lands. One of the things um, that didn't exist when Dr. Servine uh, took the helm of grizzly bear recovery was social media. Anybody think that happens? And all of these places are being affected. All of them are being affected. There's more and more of these people that are coming here. 12 million tourists come to Montana each year. So increasing numbers of recreationists pressure wildlife who try to avoid them. And the things this causes are increased stress to the animals, increased energetic demands as they move around trying to avoid people, reduced survival of young, avoidance of preferred habitats, displacement into less secure habitats, often closer to people, and increased mortality risk. So recreation is a consumptive activity. We can't ignore that. Certainly, you know, logging and timber harvest and building roads on national forests, those are consumptive, but recreation is also consumptive, and we have to face that. This is the intersection of recreation resources and landscape level habitat connectivity in the Yellowstone ecosystem. This was done by the, um, the um, GYC Ecosystem Recreation Inventory, and um, the red areas you see are high trail density and the movement patterns that are overlaid by those high, high trail density areas. And this is all, this was done in 2017. So it's much worse now. Pre-COVID. Yeah, this was all done pre-COVID. So here's our idealized Yellowstone ecosystem. You know, when we think of Yellowstone, we look at this beautiful map and you know we think of wow this is wild country you know you look out on the Gallatin range and you think you know just it's amazing out there it's just untouched and you know animals can live to some degree in places that you know there's small roads and not a lot going on but this is big sky this is what big sky looks like so can anybody here imagine having a healthy grizzly bear population in a place like this? And all the recreating and all the house development that's going on here, this is, this is risky for bears and other species. And this map is even scarier. So this is the this disturbance footprint of human activities in Western Montana. The, um, the pink areas are Settled lands, housing. The brown areas are roads and road densities across the landscape. And the blue areas are trails. Here's the Bob Marshall and Glacier Park. So this is the, the numbers of roots that we have put on the landscape in Western Montana and the development that's ongoing. So we have to think of, we, if we want the resources that we come here for, that we really value here, we have to think of how we're going to deal with this. It's not going to be free. There is a limit. And we can either recognize these limits and try to do something about it before we lose these animals, or we can lament what we have lost. Remember, we almost lost the grizzly bear. Remember the history? history? Well, I think we're looking at the next horizon here of potentially losing the grizzly bear again, or at least driving their numbers down to some lower number than we have today because of all the people that are here. This is a huge challenge. It's not easy. I don't have an answer for it. So, mountain bikes... They affect bears. 
Mountain bikers affect bears. There's no getting around that. And mountain biking is especially bad for bears because it's really fast and it's really quiet. Those two things together are a bad combination with grizzly bears. And, you know, I've had mountain bikers tell me, you know, we've ridden and we've never seen any bears. So, you know, there's not an effect. We didn't see any elk, you know, we can't have an effect because they weren't out there. Where do you think they went? They were there before you came. So every time all of us, me as I hike and mountain bikers as they ride, all of us have an effect. I I just want to add, because we've had lots of discussions about this, that one of the tendencies on the Gallatin in many national forests is that user-created trails will begin down game trails that were established by wildlife or animals that bears prey upon. And so you're basically taking these old, very important routes for wildlife out of commission. Is that right? Do you want to riff on that? Yeah, I mean, these animals avoid these places. They don't want to be there. They try to be there at night, maybe, but they're not using it in the way they've normally used it. So here we are in Bozeman, Montana again. So if you look at Yellowstone National Park, the only place that isn't buffeted by wilderness is this. All of these other areas around Yellowstone National Park buffer the effects of people on the edges. It's it's one of the reasons why you see the bear expansion range. Big Sky is right here. Bozeman's right here. Gallatin Range is right here. It goes in to Yellowstone. If you judge a place by its wildlife, which makes it wild, so i.e. if you think that wild country is created, you can define it by wild creatures that are able to live there. The Gallatin Range has all of its wildlife, and yet there's some in our community that view it as just another mountain range Yet it's extraordinary. We must not take it for granted because all of the wildlife in Greater Yellowstone exists here. If you pick the Gallatin Range up and you dropped it into any other state in the lower 48, it would be the wildest mountain range in 45 of the 48 states in the lower 48. If this were a standalone national park based on its wildlife and you dropped it into any other place. It would be the wildest national park outside of Yellowstone, Glacier, and Grand Teton. This is in our backyard. And then you've got Big Sky. You saw the photo of Big Sky. Impacts are not contained within the footprint of of humanity. There are all kinds of spillover effects here. So basically you have the Gallatin Range here that juts out kind of like a penins- the Florida Peninsula to the north. And you've got hypergrowth happening in Bozeman, the fastest growing micropolitan c- small city in America. You've got big sky that is bursting at the seams. And then you've got development pressure that's just starting to take hold in Paradise Valley. 5,000 lots that haven't been developed yet, but they're coming, they're invisible out there. So again, to get back to uh, Brent Brock's observation about open lands, what we see out there in open lands is in some ways an illusion. It's a relative illusion because we're some, in some ways looking into the past. A very different future is coming. And so one of the things that Chris and I have talked about is this importance of maintaining habitat in the core. If you could elaborate, that'd be great. This, this place here um, is, is really important. The Gallatin Range, it's right in our backyard here in Bozeman. How many of you have gone up Highlight Canyon? How many of you thought that was a great place to go recreate? How many of you were shocked? I mean, all of us, as we want to be places, we go out and affect the wildlife and the lands around us. And... Um, the squeeze is on. 
is well described by Todd here. Do you, do you know that guy, this writer who wrote a piece for Mountain Journal, Chris? Yeah, I know this guy. He's my son. <laughs> He's a crazed mountain biker, but he does understand that where you recreate makes all the difference in the world. You know, he's a crazed mountain biker, but he understands if you go places where the animals are, you're going to have an effect. And selecting the better places um, where you're not going to have an effect allows you to do the crazy things you do as a mountain biker. That's my opinion. Um, but it, it still allows some respect for the animals and the land as well. And that's what we ask you to do, you know, and you're, we don't say don't mountain bike anymore and don't recreate anymore. We just ask you to think about where you do it and how you do it. Habitat resiliency, you know, we're seeing climate change coming, it's drier, we get less snow, we get more fires, we get big changes on the landscape. It's important that we have resiliency for these animals on the landscape so that they can move to better places as the, the vegetation distribution changes, as certain foods change because of increases in, in insect numbers that are coming because it's warmer and drier. I mean, the white bark is an example of something that is happening out there on the landscape, but there's so many subtle things that are happening as climate change pushes in. So we've got all these people on top of all these bears now, and on top of that, we have climate change pushing everything around. And we're almost at the end here, the new threat. I haven't talked about this yet, <clears throat> but there is an anti-predator focus in the legislature in Montana and to some extent in Idaho. And they are pushing ways, more aggressive ways to kill predators. Some of these things result in, in grizzly bear deaths. And this is a grizzly bear that was caught in a neck snare put, put out for wolves. Um, here's a grizzly bear in a wolf trap. Here's two grizzly bear claws in a trap. And here's a grizzly bear's neck. He's been caught in a, in a neck snare for wolves and cut the snare off of him, and that's what his neck looked like. This is new. You know, we didn't see this. This never occurred more than... This started in the 2021 legislature in Montana. We never had this anti-predator attitude in Montana like exists today. And the, Montana has put out a draft grizzly bear management plan. And um, it's out for comment. Clint mentioned that. And in many ways, it is um, a disappointment. <laughs> It minimizes discussions of ways to, to reduce human bear conflicts and instead focuses on hunting, hunting grizzly bears. Hunting will not solve problems. Hunting does not reduce grizzly bear conflicts unless you kill all the bears. It proposes using lethal means to kill non-conflict bears just because they exist. This plan proposes that bears outside of recovery zones should be moved or killed just because they exist, even when they're not in a conflict. It proposes hunting females with young outside core areas to control distribution. That means that when there's a family group of bears, like you saw those pictures of 399, a hunter could shoot the female and her offspring would then be orphaned. This is actually proposed in the Montana Management Plan. It stresses hunting over conflict reduction, which is really disappointing because conflict reduction, there are many ways to successfully reduce conflicts with bears on the landscape. And throughout the plan is this tone of intolerance for grizzly bears. Grizzly bears are the Montana state animal. We should be proud to have grizzly bears in Montana. We should be very happy that we are the state with more grizzly bears than any other other than Alaska. But instead, this plan is full of intolerance for bears, ways to go out and kill them and reduce their numbers and kill a lot of bears as soon as they're delisted. 
this kind of attitude from the legislature and by this, from this Montana plan is the reason that I've changed my mind about delisting. I never thought this would happen. It was never out there. There are really good people in the state fish and game agencies. I want you, want you to know that. These are not the biologists in the state agencies that are proposing this stuff. This is politicians. This is really scary and harmful. So this is 399, living on the landscape. It, this is a, an afternoon in Grand Teton National Park with bear watchers. And I asked Chris as we were putting this together, when you see that, what do you think? Well, in one way, it's a problem because all these people are out there to see these bears, but they're really pretty well controlled by the Park Service. You know, the thing that really makes me feel good about this is that all these people care enough about this bear to come to this place and get up at five in the morning and watch and bring their kids and drive all the way from Florida and go into the national parks, go into Lamar Valley in June at five o'clock in the morning and there will be hundreds of cars out there filled with people from all over the United States because they want to see a grizzly bear. It makes their day, it makes their trip. That makes me feel good. These bears are valuable, they're really important. And we should do everything we can to help them out. Three ninety nine again. So remember, thirty females alive in the entire Greater Yellowstone, and they did everything they could to keep female bears alive in the early days. So, what's the benefit of keeping one female alive? This is actually an old uh, lineage chart for 399. So today there are 24 descendants of 399. She could have been removed from the population in 2017. 24 offspring descended in her bloodline, a single bloodline. Remember that. 30 females in all of greater Yellowstone in the early 80s She's responsible for 24 of those. The thing is, about half of them have died in various forms of run-ins with people. So it's not easy being a grizzly bear, making your living off the land. Before I turn this back over to Chris, this is 399, about 350 to 400 pounds. This is on a summer when she's had three sets of triplets, one set of quadruplets, a couple of pairs. This last summer, she turned her cubs out as two and a half year olds. One of them died. And she was seen in the company of this fellow. His name is Bruno, nicknamed Bruno. Bruno is 800 pounds. And so one of the interesting things in grizzly bears is that temperaments matter. All bears are not equal. The temperament of the mother and the temperament of the father. So in this chart here, 24 offspring, there's never been one of 399's cubs that's ever mauled a person or attacked them. And so temperament really matters. Bears matter, populations matter, and individuals matter. One thing I want to say before I hand this back is I think it's really important that we give a round of applause to all the people in our wildlife agencies, fish and wildlife agencies, state and federal, because they have thankless jobs and they're in a tough political environment, it, particularly uh, members of Grizzly Bear folk who have worked with grizzly bears over the years. Grizzly bear research was pioneered in this ecosystem. So let's give a hand for our civil servants. The, the other thing I want to mention is this wouldn't have happened without citizens out there. 
Many of you have worked for conservation groups. Many of you want to work for conservation groups. Many of you support conservation groups. This is, this isn't a hokey thing. It's that support, it's the hundreds of thousands of comments that flew in when the delisting proposal was going. So it, it all matters, it makes a difference. So we've come a long way in 40 years, and our challenge is to keep the populations that we've gotten to healthy status, to keep them that way, with the increasing numbers of people on the landscape, the, the negative attitudes of some politicians, and climate change on top of that. Um, you know, if you look at it, is it a lost cause? You can just throw up your hands and say, oh, I quit, I can't do it. Um, no, I don't think so. If, if you think of the way, what was happening in 1981 when we started, that there were only 30 females in the system, they were isolated and all the agencies hated each other and wouldn't work together. Um, we got that fixed. We got 1,100 bears on the landscape in the Yellowstone system now. We should be able to do the right thing to keep these bears healthy. We all have to be involved. You have to be involved. And if we all work together, I think we can solve this problem. It's not going to be easy, and it won't be free. There will be a cost, but I think we can do it. So, go for it. Okay. So again, wildness that existed, rewilding, we brought this thing back. The problem is, is that if we dewild Greater Yellowstone, subdivisions aren't going to go away. We're on a very thin margin of recovery right now. And so the question that I often think about at Mountain Journal is, are we going to be remembered as the generation that dewilded our part of the West for the last time? I don't have a bright enough mind to be able to know into the future, but... Chris has a good guess with grizzly bears. What do you think? Well, if we do nothing and let it disappear, let them disappear and let all the people move in and do what they're doing, then we will lose the grizzly bear again, yes. I think we'll get them down to, you know, very minimum levels. We won't use strychnine to do it. We'll use recreation and we'll use housing development. But the effect on the bears will be the same. I think we can make a difference though. I think by recognizing the problem, that's the number one step and recognizing all of us have a responsibility to do things to help. And when you go out there and you recreate and you think of where you're gonna do it and how you're gonna do it, think of the animals that live there. You're doing that in their living room. They live there. You're just a visitor. So we are ready to open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions, we thank you for your attention and um, we hope it's been useful to you to have this, this discussion. We have a, um, a helper tonight from the Sacagawea Audubon Society. She's one of the young new generations. Uh, her name is Emma Narotsky, and she's going to be directing questions to Chris. And before she steps up and does it, I have a question for you, Chris, if I may. Could you tell us what happened in Idaho, the controversy that erupted there last fall? Okay, for those of you that don't know, there was a, a female grizzly bear with two cubs near Tetonia, Idaho. This bear had gotten into problems up by Gardner and had been moved down to West Yellowstone. Then this bear moved down toward um, Tetonia and was living down there with her two cubs. She hadn't caused any problems. She hadn't um, threatened anybody. She wasn't an issue, wasn't into garbage. She wasn't doing anything wrong. She was feeding on natural foods. And somehow um, certain agency people decided that she was a threat and they went in and shot her and her two cubs. And, um, you know, I used to manage all the grizzly bear issues like that, relocations and removals, and um, all those are, are guided by what's called the grizzly bear special rule, which is it sets forth the limits on what you can do with grizzly bears. And it says grizzly bears can be taken, taken means killed, 
if in self-defense or defense of others, and grizzly bears can be taken if they are um, a threat, and it's not possible to relocate that bear. I'm paraphrasing what it says, not very long, special rule. But what happened with that bear was not according to the grizzly bear special rule, and that is a violation of, of the management guidelines for grizzly bears. I know there's a lot of concern about this, and I think the agencies are reevaluating what they did and why they did it, and I would hope there would be a, a better way to do it next time. This bear did not need to be removed. She wasn't causing any problems, and she and her cubs didn't need to be shot. So hopefully this will be a lesson, and uh, we'll see better results in the management of bears in the future. Hey, Chris, will you explain, to why... You have concerns about the state of Montana's plans and it inhibiting the ability to relocate bears. Could you explain why that's important? Well, for 40 years, Montana has been a, um, a partner, a full partner in the recovery of grizzly bears. And all the good people that work for Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks have been very much a part of that. And f when we had a conflict, let's say there was a bear that was outside the recovery zone and maybe it killed a calf or something. You know, normally we catch these bears and we relocate them for the first time. And if it's a female with cubs, we often give her a couple opportunities to be, to be moved. And, and the way this was done is the bear managers with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks would catch a bear. They would talk to me on the phone, you know, this bear hasn't done anything wrong, let's move it. And then they would take that bear and move it into a, a better place usually inside the recovery zone, to get it away from the conflict that it had been involved in. But the legislature in 2021 passed a law that if a grizzly bear was in any kind of conflict outside a recovery zone, that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks was forbidden to relocate the bear. And what that meant was that all these bears would be killed. That was their intent. They wanted all these bears to be killed instead of relocated. And what the Fish and Wildlife Service did is they went and they hired five different, five new biologists to move those bears. So now the Fish and Wildlife Service moves those bears. And, um, you know, the intent of, of the legislature was to get all these bears killed. And it resulted in Fish, Wildlife, and Parks losing the authority to actually manage and regulate mortality and conflicts on bears. So it's a very negative backward move and most unfortunate so emma are you ready yeah so we have um to start with kathy powell and steve story are asking about how to tell uh where we should be recreating what trails in the gallatin range um and just what areas in general have the lowest impact on wildlife well i can't tell you that right off the top of my head i think that's a really good question though for the Forest Service to be thinking about where the trails are in places where wildlife need to be and identifying those trails and using that identification. Is it in spring range? Is it going through a berry habitat? Is it a place that maybe bears are in the fall? Um, and then maybe closing those places or advertising that here are the places to spring recreate, here are the places to not spring recreate based on that. I think there's a lot of data available to put such maps together, and that would be a real thing for the Forest Service to do to help recreators. No places to mountain bike, no places to hike. And there are plenty of places to hike where there's not a lot of grizzly bears too. And um, a lot of good places to go um, where you can go and do things on mountain bikes and, and trail running and things like that where you're not gonna run into grizzly bears. But that's the kind of thing the Forest Service can do and take into account the fact that there are all these recreators on the landscape and let's balance the needs of these people with the needs of the animals. And I make that suggestion knowing the supervisor of the Gallatin Forest is in the audience tonight, so, Mary. <laughs> Another question? Um, Jeff asks, um, should wildlife NGOs use their resources to coordinate the tourism industry to push for uh, legislation in favor of grizzly bears based on an economic argument? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, I, I don't have an answer for that one either. I mean, it, 
it's going to take a partnership between the tourism industry, the mountain bike industry, the, the REI type industries about where we recreate and how we recreate in grizzly bear habitat in order to better achieve this balance. And partnering together and working together is going to be the key to success in getting that done. So everybody's got to work together and understand that, you know, we do much better as partners than we do as individual groups. Uh, Taylor asks, how do you think about habitat connectivity in the Gallatin Valley? How does I-90 impact this? And is there any proposal for wildlife corridors to allow for connectivity between the Gallatins and the Bridgers? Mm. Yeah, the Gallatin and the Bridgers, that's, you know, it looks good, but I think the west side of the Bridgers is in pretty well developed and um, um, you know is it possible for animals to get through all that development um, you know as you go up toward Bridger Bowl and and then on the west side I, I don't know I, I don't know I think you know if we look if we look at the the movement patterns of bears and there's been some really excellent work produced again by the interagency grizzly bear study team that shows the possible movement routes between the Yellowstone ecosystem and and populations to the north they basically go to the northwest. And um, that's, those papers are available in published form and they have good maps in them. You know, they're going through the, uh, the tobacco routes and, uh, and heading up toward Butte and, and that area. Um, and as you see on that map that we showed, there's a lot of bears in that intervening area already. So they're using that country now. I don't believe we have any any verified bears in the Bridgers as yet. Most of those bears are northwest of, of Bozeman at the west end of the Gallatin Valley. We've got a few questions about um, specific uh, recommendations and just uh, see if you can get your comments on these, Chris. Uh, seasonal recreation closures. Um, are there any efforts in the Gallatin County to implement zoning regulations um, and then taxes on things like vacation homes um, and just limiting development? The, the seasonal trail use, I think, is going to be the key to success. And there was a, um, a fatality of a mountain biker um, a few years back who was killed by a grizzly bear when he was mountain biking. And we have what's called a border review that puts together a report on those, um, what happened and what we can do to prevent it in the future. And the border review put out a series of recommendations to the Forest Service about the management of mountain biking. And um, seasonal closures is part of that. And identifying that when these trails go through important habitat that maybe they should be regulated somehow. So yes, there are ways to do that. And we've actually put that out in, um, in a written format at this point. I don't know how much of it is applied in the Gallatin area. I'll let Todd answer the questions about the zoning. And so there is no zoning. There are special zoning districts um, in which the neighborhoods themselves volunteer to create a zoning district, but there is not countywide zoning. Um, one thing about funding, this is what I've heard talking to scientists and others. Having enough money would be a game changer for Greater Yellowstone. The problem is, and the criticism is, is that the state legislatures are handicapping the ability of local communities to, to tax themselves. They won't even allow local residents to go to the polls and tax themselves. What this means is we've had billions of dollars in real estate value change hands between Jackson, Teton Valley, Big Sky, Bozeman, billions of dollars, largely by outsiders moving here. A, th a device called a real estate transfer tax of just 1% that exists in other states would generate billions of dollars over time. And that money could go in to reward and keep farmers and ranchers on the land because they have a lot of important private land habitat. It could incentivize zoning. Another thing is, um, Chris mentioned it before, that hunters and anglers already pay taxes through the, their gear and a, a tax on equipment. There is no tax on all of the rest of us who recreate. 
And so there's been talk of a backpack tax that if implemented nationwide could also produce billions of dollars over time. And that kind of money uh, to flood in here, you know, basically uh, for people who are coming to Montana, there's this thing that economists call free riders where they come in and, and use our services, but they don't pay to use the services. So there are several devices like that. There are 25 things in my book, Ripple Effects, that talk primarily about revenue sources. But in addition to that, if you, don't, if you have voluntary planning and zoning, the city of Bozeman is now doing a, a sensitive land study that you've heard of. That's advisory. And if you look into a developer's face and you say, I advise you to please protect wildlife habitat, that doesn't turn out very well for wildlife habitat usually. Next question. Um, this is about um, getting the public to support these protections. So once the general public is aware of the challenges, what percentage of that public support changes required to preserve habitats? And then another similar question about balancing uh, the impact of recreation against ensuring access to wildlife to make sure that people have that connection and want to protect it, and whether that access is going to rich people or available for all. You talk about the recreation equals conservation. Yeah, yeah um, that's a really, all those things are really good topics for master's or PhD projects in an economics department. Um, I'd love to see MSU folks and U of M folks take that type of thing on because that's what we need to know. Nobody really has that together yet that I'm aware of. Um, and, and you hear these phrases that recreation is conservation. Recreation is not conservation. Recreation affects wildlife in a negative way. And let's get off the idea that recreation is conservation. I'm a recreationist, but I don't pretend anymore that it's great for wildlife to do it. I think we all need to take responsibility, every one of us, as to what we do and how it's going to affect the wildlife out there and the habitat. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Jonathan Reddy asks about the impact of poaching on grizzlies. Poaching. Well, I define poaching as people that actively go out and try to kill bears to sell parts or something like that. That's a rare thing that probably doesn't happen much at all. There is something else that we call vandal killing, which is people that sh just shoot bears and leave them because they don't like bears. It's a hateful thing. Um, that does occur out there. Um, you know, it's not a, a really big deal at this point. Um, but it certainly does occur a little bit. But, you know, the biggest impacts on grizzly bears are not those kinds of things. They're, you know, conflicts with elk hunters like surprise encounters and there's a defense. Um, some conflicts with livestock. Bears that get into conflicts with people say they get into, you know, garbage or something like that and they have to be relocated or removed. Um, those are all management challenges. Those bears, many, in many cases, have to die. Um, and then there's bears that get hit by cars um, and, and things like that. But poaching and vandal killing, it's not a huge source of mortality. Okay, um, lots of questions about this uh, draft management plan and how to best respond to it. Um, so in addition to commenting on the draft management plan, um, putting pressure on state politicians, um, how can we change that there are no non-lethal protocols in this draft? And where can we find some citations um, for specific sections in the management plan so that people can be specific um, with their comments? Well, if you go to the Montana Wildlife Federation website, our comments are on that website. And... Um, Search for the comments on the grizzly bear plan. Uh, there's 18 pages of real specific stuff that's in those comments, and that would give you information about what's in the plan and what we object to at the Montana Wildlife Federation. Hey, 
Hank Perry asks, um, if you can expand on the death of the grizzlies in Idaho and how that policy might have played out in Wyoming or Montana and how those three states can work better together. I, I talked about this a little bit already. You know, it's a, it's a tragic event that I hope is a learning experience to get the agencies to work better together. So um, it didn't work out very well. I think there were some serious mistakes made and hopefully they won't be made again. Okay, it sounds like we have time for one more question, and this comes from Justin Berardi. Um, if we could fast forward to five years from now, what do you think would be some of the key milestones that would be indicators of success on this front, both for people and grizzlies and all wild animals? Well, I think the, the best indicator would be that our population of grizzly bears is stable to increasing gradually. Right now, the population is increasing about 1.3% per year. And if we could maintain that population trajectory as stable or positive, that's our, our best indicator of success. The study team carefully monitors that and uh, they will provide those data for us. And of course, our conflicts, you know, the numbers of bears that die and why they die, um, that's a critical number. and. Um, uh, you know, it's real hard to document how bears and other animals move away from recreators and people and, uh, and how they avoid subdivisions. You know, that's a real difficult thing to document. But mortality and population growth are probably our best indicators right now. So is that our last question? All right, I want to thank you. Uh, Todd and I want to thank you for being here all this time and sitting here. And, uh, I just wanted to say another thank you so much to uh, both Chris and Todd for just a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for coming. I just want to let you know that a recording of this talk will be available at uh, GallatinValleyGrizzly.org if you register for this event. Protecting wildlife.